step one of my new series of clinical reasoning case studies titled One, Two, Three, emphasize the importance of thinking more like a nurse by recognizing what is relevant and what are the nursing priorities. Step two of clinical reasoning one, two, three, emphasizes the importance of recognizing relationships to think like a nurse. And there are six essential relationships that will help the nurse put the picture together or the clinical puzzle and how these pieces fit. And this is what these six relationships are that will be integrated and incorporated in this clinical reasoning case study, step number two. Relationship number one, what is the relationship of the past medical history and current medications? Relationship number two, what is the relationship between relevant present problem data and the primary medical problem? Number three, what is the relationship between the relevant clinical data and the primary problem? Number four, the relationship between the primary medical problem and the nursing priority. Number five, relationship between the primary care provider's orders and the primary problem. And finally, the relationship between the diseases in the past medical history that may have contributed to the development of the current problem. So let's begin with this scenario. It's the same scenario on heart failure and the patient that we had in step one, but now we're gonna take a different focus and kind of look at it from a different lens or perspective. Not the head on, just gonna look at it a little from the side and look at these six relationships. And here we go. So we're gonna start with look at the relationship of the past medical history of this patient and her current medications. So let's look, she's got a past medical history of diabetes type two, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, hyperlipidemia, chronic renal insufficiency. She's had a CVA, has the systolic heart failure, has had an MI with stents times two. Her home medications, aspirin, carbidolol, lisinopril, azetamide, hydralazine, torsamide, potassium, warfarin, and glyburide. What we want our students to do, I'm not gonna do all of these medications in this case study presentation, but we want them to recognize what medications are treating what past medical history problems. And just kind of drawing a line to connect those dots literally together. So for example, the diabetes mellitus type, type two, that would be our azetamide, 10 milligrams. The hypertension, lisinopril, five milligrams, et cetera. So we want them to make that connection. That's relationship number one. This is ideally suited for fundamental students. In fact, this entire series of case studies is well suited for practical or first semester students. As we look at the patient care scenario, it, it, it unfolds the same way as it did in step one. And we're gonna again identify and highlight the importance of recognizing relevant data. So our vital signs, 98.6, our pulse is 92, rate is 26, blood pressure 162 over 54, O2 sats of 90%. Our nursing assessment, patient is anxious and restless. Breath sounds have coarse crackles scattered throughout both lung fields. Cardiac is in atrial fibrillation. Her extremities are pale and cool to the touch. Pulse is palpable throughout. Has the 3 plus pitting edema with the S3 murmur. Neurologically, she's alert and oriented to person, place, time, and situation. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, with bowel sounds in all four quadrants. She's voiding without difficulty, and has skin integrity is intact. She has the infiltrates consistent on chest x-ray that are consistent with pulmonary edema. Her white count, her cells are 4.8 on the white. Hemoglobin is 12 dying, platelets are 228, and her neutrophils are 68%. Sodium is 133, K is 4.9, glucose 105, calcium 8.8, .8, and creatinine 2.9, again with that same trend of 2.2. On her magnesium, miscellaneous chemistries, her magnesium is 1.9, and her INR is 2.5. As we look at her troponin, 0.1, and her BNP is 1855. And so when we look at this data and interpreting it, as Christine Tanner identified in her model of clinical judgment, this data must recognize recognizing relevant data 
as well as then making the interpretation. And again, is there a problem present? That's step number one of Tanner's model. The nurse must recognize that, yes, there is. Secondly, what is it? It's biventricular heart failure. But now we drill a little bit deeper in this case study because in order for students to recognize relationships, they must have a deep understanding of pathophysiology. So now we ask the question, we want our students to say, what is the underlying cause or pathophysiology of the primary problem of biventricular heart failure? And this is why it's imperative that nurse educators contextualize and situate pathophysiology in A and P, not as a prerequisite and assume that your students know it. Many of them don't. We need to bring it back and integrate it throughout the curriculum in nursing education. So we want them to explain the difference in their own words, not copied out of the website or in their textbook, of right-sided failure, left-sided failure, biventricular failure. Could your students do that? That is our goal because it is that level of understanding that lays the foundation of not only clinical thinking, but critical thinking. So let's keep going with this uh, scenario. Our relationship number two to think like a nurse is identifying what is the relationship between relevant current problem data and the primary medical problem that the patient presented with. And in this scenario, Joanne Smith is a 72-year-old woman who has that history of MI, systolic heart failure with ischemic cardiomyopathy with a current EF of only 15%. She presents to the ED with that shortness of breath, and it's progressed from shortness of breath with activity to shortness of breath at rest. The last two nights, she had to sleep in her recliner chair to rest comfortably upright. She can speak only in partial sentences and has to take a breath when talking to the nurse. She has an increased swelling of three plus pitting edema and six pounds in the last three days. And so it's the same scenario, but we want our students to intentionally recognize not just what's relevant, but to see the relationship of that relevant clinical data to the pathophysiology of heart failure. So putting that connection together of how does a systolic ejection fraction of 15% influence the presentation of the orthopnea, the weight gain, the coarse crackles, etc., are all pieces of clinical data. We want our students to have that deeper knowledge of thinking like a nurse by recognizing these relationships. So then we're looking at the relationship number three of the relationship between relevant clinical data and the primary problem. So now we're going back to those vital signs, the heart rate of A92 that was irregular, looking at atrial fibrillation. She is on Coumadin. That should tell us that, yes, she does have atrial fibrillation as a pre-existing problem. This is not a new finding, but it must be noted by the nurse. She also has that respiratory rate of 26. Why would she be tachypneic? This is where we want to drill deep with our students and look at abnormal clinical data and simply ask our students the three-worded question, why? Why is she tachypneic? Why is her blood pressure elevated? Why does she require those six liters of oxygen with the nasal cannula? When we look at her physical assessment, why is she anxious and restless? Why does she have those crackles? Why can't she sleep flat? Orthopnea must not just be interpreted as a symptom, but the students must know why that orthopnea is present and why they can't lie flat, how that increases preload. And they're already overloaded, and that extra volume is just overwhelming the heart. By sitting upright, gravity does its trick, and it doesn't come as quickly to the right side of the heart. That must be known by our students. Then we look at the S3 gallop. What does the S3 gallop represent? Well, it's that, uh, it's that, it's that splitting of the second heart, so that bump rum, bump rum, bump rum commonly seen in heart failure. But is it new or is it pre-existing? That's something the student or the nurse must identify. So those are all key relationships the students must know. Let's go to relationship number four. What is the relationship between the primary medical problem 
and the nursing priority. So now we know that the medical problem, this is where the medical model and the nursing model come together. We must recognize they both have significance and relevance. We have the biventricular failure, and we also have our nursing priorities we identified in the last step number one of needing to improve oxygenation. We need to decrease the workload of the heart, and we need to remove that excess fluid volume. But now we want to see how they're related, Same how will the nursing priority, for example, of removing excess fluid volume going to benefit the patient with heart failure? That our nursing priorities are also helping the medical resolution of the primary problem of heart failure. Why do we need to decrease the workload of the heart? How is improving oxygenation going to help this patient who has biventricular failure? So putting that relationship together, medical priorities, nursing priorities, they dovetail. And the students need to see that they're not swimming in different orbits, but that the nursing plan of care is directly complementing and helping this patient resolve their problem in coming back to homeostasis. Let's go to relationship number five. What is the relationship between the primary care provider orders and the primary problem? So the physician orders the following. Titrate oxygen to keep SATs greater than 92%. Furosemide, 40 milligrams, IV push. Nitroglycerin, IV drip. Titrate to keep systolic blood pressure less than 130. Strict INO, fluid restrictions of 2,000 liters daily, and a low-sodium diet. This is why pathophysiology must be deeply understood, as well as pharmacology. For example, what is the significance of the physician ordering furosemide, which is the most powerful and potent loop diuretic, versus thiazide or diuril? Why would the doctor not order that? They're both diuretics. The nurse must understand the significance of the pharmacology and physiology of a, of a distal tubule diuretic and a loop diuretic and how they're similar, but they're also very different, as well as when you give Lasix, what electrolytes are going to be depleted? As we know, it's potassium primarily and sodium and magnesium secondary. Why would the physician order nitroglycerin? So with every one of these physician orders, the nurse must be able to state the rationale of the physician primary plan of care. And looking at nitroglycerin, how, it, how it's a vasodilator, helps to displace extra volume as well as lower the systolic pressure indirectly, decreases the workload of the heart. Those relationships must be known by our students. Finally, relationship number six. What is the relationship between the diseases in the patient's past medical history that may have contributed to the progression and development of the current problem? As we know, elderly patients or patients who have chronic medical comorbidities have numerous past medical problems, and it's these problems of exacerbation of heart failure did not exist in isolation, but many of the physiologic problems have a domino, and one problem causes a another causes a third. And in her history of diabetes, hypertension, AFib, high cholesterol, chronic renal insufficiency, CBA, heart failure, and MI, what began first? We want our students to be able to know their physiology well enough to know what likely happened first and then what triggered the next domino. And as I look at this patient, I would say that her diabetes type 2 likely began the trigger and began to cause atherosclerosis changes vascular, causing the hypertension, causing the hyperlipidemia, which led to the MI and to the heart failure, to the AFib and to the stroke. So recognizing those physiologic relationships, then students require guidance with this one. This is a difficult relationship, but as an educator, we must guide them to see the domino and how these medical problems are related. With step number two, recognizing relationships. You are empowered as an educator to bring meaningful active learning to your classroom or clinical post-conference that emphasizes important thinking like a nurse skills. This can only be found on my website, keithrn.com. And I want you to help your students to think more like a nurse. Therefore, check out and obtain clinical reasoning one, two, three today.